thank you to both of you and to Ms. Heiss, the high school principal as well. At this time, uh, I would like to introduce Dr. Bice, our state superintendent. He told me that, of course, no formal introduction. So I told him I wouldn't use a formal introduction. I would just tell you what, what I really um, thought about Dr. Bice as our leader, as I think I am moving his presentation right here before your very eyes on the screen. So, you know, you, you can fix it back. So it's okay. Um, we'll see how quick you are on your feet, which I think pretty quick. But, but what I really want you to know is that in my 23 years in education, and I could ask the other superintendents from this area that all of us interact with Dr. Bice um, just on a continuous basis. I think what we would all say is that he inspires us to inspire our people in our schools and in our communities to be the best that they can be for our children. And that I have not found another uh, bigger advocate for children and for Alabama's children and for our community's children than sits right there in that seat with Dr. Bice. His vision for our state, his ability to part the waters for us when we have all of these innovative ideas of how we want to do it differently than it was done 50 years ago or even 15 minutes ago. He openly and overwhelmingly supports us to put those things aside from the past and do what's right for children. So with that said, our number one leader that does what's right for children, Dr. Tommy Bass. see she fixed it she's a smart lady so uh, before I start I want to thank you our interpreter who's here tonight we talked earlier uh, my first job was AIDB in Talladega I was a teacher at the school for the blind so it's so nice to meet you tonight and thank you for interpreting for our group thank you okay And uh, I don't do podiums well, so I'll end up down there before this is over, but um, I just want to thank you. I'm overwhelmed by the crowd that's here tonight. It speaks volumes for this area of the state uh, that you would come out on a Tuesday evening and want to hear about public education in our state. I know we have college students here. I know we have elementary students here. We have parents. We have a variety of folks here, and I just want to thank you for that. And I want to be respectful of your time, and we have some very specific things I want to accomplish while I'm with you tonight. The first thing is I want to give you just a snapshot of where we were, where we are, and where we're headed in public education in our state. We're excited about some of the opportunities we now have. We want to spend some time at the end in a question and answer period so we can hear from you, hear questions, hear concerns, hear ideas, anything you want to share with us. Uh, we'll spend about 30 minutes at the end doing that because we want to leave having learned something as well, but the, the major thing, the whole reason we're doing this 12 city tour is to reach out and trying to engage a larger group of people in this thing we call public education. Beyond just the people who work in our school, beyond just the parents, but making sure that business and industry, that a broader group of parents are involved, that kids are involved and people understand very clearly where we're trying to move public education in our state. So that's the, our goals for the evening. And just to put it in context, I think that's always important that the decisions we made are not made without context. Two and a half years ago, I had the opportunity to be chosen to be state superintendent. Um, I reflect back on that and I'm still confused as to why our state board really chose me and uh, let me share with you why. Uh, the day of my interview when I walked in and I have a couple of my staff here that were around during that period, the state board said, is there anything you need to share with us before we begin the interview that might influence our decision? I said, well, there probably are some things you need to know before you get into this with me. And there were three things I shared with them. And Janet referenced this. Uh, I will always, without exception, make decisions based on what's right for children. Uh, I've done that for over 30 years, and it has yet to fail me. Uh, when we make decisions based on, based on what's right for children, we tend to make right decisions. It's when we start getting into the grown folks stuff that we sometimes make it complicated. Uh, I make a lot of people angry because of that. I'm not real politically correct. I get in trouble in Montgomery quite a bit, but that's okay. 
uh, because that's what I'm there for. I also shared with them, and I've not shared this publicly until I ask, but I think it's important. Politically, I'm an independent. I don't need a party to tell me what to think. I have 745, I have 745,000 constituents, and those are our kids and their families, and that's who I represent. Uh, gets me in a little bit of trouble too, but that's okay because when you do what's right for kids, it typically works out. And at the end of the day, we want to create a system that serves children and actually produces something that when they leave our program in 12th grade, they're ready for what comes next. And regretfully, we had not been doing that for a variety of reasons. So I uh, was ready to step in and make some disruption if allowed to do that, and they have allowed me now for two and a half years to do that. I love disruption. I love to cause disequilibrium within an organization that has been the same for far too long and see what happens. That excites me. Uh, Janet's a partner in that crime because she loves it too. So uh, we went out and I went to my board and I said, let me ask you two quick questions before we begin all this. Could I get a group of people together and say, what would we create for a public education in this state if we didn't have to follow the rules under No Child Left Behind which was a federal law that we've lived under for far too long that should have been revised at least four years ago. Exactly what we needed a decade ago, but it has long outlived what it was set up for. If we could do away with that and ignore it, ignore the folks, excuse me, my fellow and great representatives in the back, but ignore the legislature and the governor and all the politics that go into public education and really develop a plan for children. What might that look like? And we got excited because we realized if we did that, we could do something that was actually somewhat more simple than what we had, but far more impactful. So we went around asking questions about what that would look like, and what we found was we had great people. The teachers and educators in this room, they're the people that do this work. They're the thinkers to make all this happen. They're the people that guide these little brains that are sitting out there to create and innovate and do innovative things with, with content, but we've been holding them captive because we had a system we had a system that wasn't set up to serve kids. And I'm very fortunate to have a partnership with, a, I'm scared to say this with Donna sitting in the room, but with Jacksonville State University, who did a little video clip that kind of captures where we were that spurs thinking about what it might look like next. And I'd like to share that with you real quick, if we could, and then we'll start our discussion. Education as we know it is becoming obsolete. And I don't mean like a year old smartphone. I mean like using 19th century tools to solve 21st century problems, because it's exactly like that. After all, the way we educate our children has stayed pretty much the same since we even conceived of doing it. Listen to lectures, read and regurgitate, bubble in the answers, put a little hat on and call it a day. At this point, do we really think we're preparing them for the breathtaking ride that is the arc of human achievement and innovation in the 21st century? Probably not. And let, let me be clear, the problem is not teachers. Our teachers are doing an incredible job, all while working within an outdated, broken model. Renowned educator and philosopher John Dewey once said, if we teach today's students as we taught yesterday's, we rob them of tomorrow. And that was in 1944. So great, we've established the problem. What's the solution? Start over from scratch. No, no, it's totally kidding. That, that's crazy. Here's the thing. There is no one right answer yet. But there are a lot of possible great answers. And those of us who are asking the question are absolutely thrilled with the possibilities. And that sets us up for where we are. The possibilities if we're willing to ask questions and question the way we've done things. Let me pose three questions to you that you don't have to answer out loud, but think about this for a minute. Why do we have school between 7.30 and 3? Where is it written in law? Where is it written in code? Where is it written in Montgomery that school has to happen between 7.30 and 3? Where is it written anywhere in law or in code that school has to happen between Monday and Friday? Where is it written anywhere that school has to happen? Where is it in law anywhere that says school has to happen between August and May? It does not exist anywhere in law or in writing anywhere. Why do we continue to do it? Why do we continue to do it the same way we've always done it? Because we think we don't have permission to do it any other way. What I've realized is 90% of the things that we do in public education, it's been passed down from generation to generation and we just never question it. So we began to question every single bit of it. 
and find out what it is we really have to do and what is it that we have flexibility on. And we realized we didn't even have a plan for public education in the state of Alabama that had a goal of where we wanted to be in one year, five years, 10 years, or 20 years. And we put together, based on research, based on best practice, a plan called Plan 2020. I didn't invent this. We came about it through research and looking across the country, looking across other nations, looking at what is it that best takes children from point A to point B, and we narrowed it down to four areas. What do we do to equip our learners to be college and career ready? What do we do to develop support systems for our children who come to school not ready to learn? What do we do to create professionals who are ready to teach children in a 21st century environment that may look very different than the school they went to? And how do we finally create a policy environment for schools and school systems to innovate and create and not be limited by the way we've done school forever? That's our plan, four key areas with goals and objectives under each one. And that's what we're going to talk about a little bit tonight. But let me tell you how, where we started with this and why we developed this plan. We have forever had a vision in our state that every child be a graduate, but we realized that just graduating them wasn't enough that they had to be prepared for the company that you heard so much about tonight, that it has such an entity here in Florence. They need to be prepared for what comes next. And we realized we weren't. So we spent three months, three months of the first three months I was on the job. I took a team of about five people and we went to every community college in the state. We went to every four-year college in the state, met with their education faculty and their arts and science faculties. We met with any business and industry that would meet with us from Florence to Dothan, from Huntsville to Mobile and across. We spent three months doing that and we asked one question, one single question every time we met with a group. And that question was, what is it about Alabama high school graduates today that is lacking when you get them? That was our only question. And we collected all of those responses and we came back and we sat down and very quickly, one very clear message rose to the top. And it was exactly the same for our four-year research universities as it was for business and industry, as it was for our community colleges, and it was that students graduating from public schools in Alabama today lack intellectual curiosity. I want you to think about that for a minute. Students graduating after 13 years of school, including kindergarten, lack intellectual curiosity. As a brand new state superintendent, that was the worst message I could have possibly gotten. Because I sat there and thought, how in the world do we take a system that serves 745,000 students with 90,000 employees in 136 school systems and 1,500 schools that is going in this direction and shift it to go in another one? But we sat down and we sat down with parents and children and teachers and administrators and business folks and we very quickly got to feeling a lot better because we realized why it happened. And if you're a parent in this room, if you're a child that's been in school over the last 10 years, if you're an educator, you know this all too well, we realized very quickly that we've spent over a decade preparing children to take a test rather than preparing them to think. And what could we do if we remove the focus on testing and really begin to teach to the, to the needs and interest of children and not be worried that the test that's given in the spring is gonna come back to haunt us next year. So we did that. We developed this plan around the belief that assessment is important, but it's important that it's used in the right way. And I am so pleased that our state board, I don't know if Mr. Newman's here tonight that represents this area, but our state board has passed a resolution that says we cannot use our test scores to evaluate a teacher, to rank a school, to make a list, to do the things that we've done forever because it's wrong. And it has held teachers captive for a long, long time. So we then said, we need to change our vision to not only should they be, should graduate, but they graduate prepared for college, work, and adulthood in the 21st century. But folks, let me tell you how far off we were from that. Let me show you some statistics that tells you why we needed to change. We didn't just do this arbitrarily. We needed to do this. I was a high school principal at Benjamin Russell High School in Ellick City for years. Loved being a high school principal. Would do it again in a heartbeat. Uh, but one of the things that I detested was giving the Alabama high school graduation exam. Number one, it took 20 days out of instruction 
when we could have been teaching children, plus the results meant nothing. It's the biggest waste of time we've ever done in public education because it meant nothing. And let me show you just how little it meant. The last time we gave it, and thank goodness, within the first few months of being on the job, our state board passed that we would no longer give it. We'd get rid of it, uh, which puts 20 days of instruction back into the day. But uh, on our last administration of it, if you take the whole senior class of the state of Alabama, 55,000 students, and look at their results, 97% of them passed all parts of the graduation exam, all five parts. And we celebrated it, we put it on billboards, we gave out certificates, we had ice cream parties, we did all this hoopla all the time lying to our kids and their parents that they were prepared for what comes next. And let me show you how off base we were. If you look at that same senior class, I'm gonna come over in your space for a minute, you're okay. Uh, if you look at that same senior class from that year, the 76% of them that took the ACT, which we automatically know are only those students who were thinking about furthering their education, so we know who didn't take it. Uh, if you look at that 76% in mathematics, 31% of the 76% met the college readiness benchmark in math on the ACT, which was a 22. The same group of students that we celebrated that 97% of them met our expectations in math on the Alabama high school graduation exam. Humphrey, it's no great surprise, and Donna, no great surprise, that 30% of our kids who were leaving Alabama high schools were enrolled in remedial education three months after we gave them a diploma in our two-year colleges and four-year colleges because our expectations were totally unaligned, and that is unacceptable. And we've admitted that, we've said it, and we now have a goal that every child that graduates from high school and gets a diploma that has our name on it does not have to be enrolled in remedial education because that's unacceptable. Why should a parent be paying for their child's education through their taxes one time and paying tuition a second time for the thing we just told them they should have learned in high school? So we've changed the trajectory of where we need to be in making sure that our students are ready for what comes next. But our biggest challenge, this is why we're doing this tour, our biggest challenge is to change our mindset, to change our mindset about what school looks like, about what our expectations for kids needs to be. We need to believe all kids can exceed, can succeed at levels we've never thought possible before. And let me give you a couple of examples that tell me it can happen. We can choose, I know it's not gonna happen in this area because I know these superintendents, they're all about this change. But we could choose to continue to have school that looks like the picture on your left. Uh, let me digress a minute and tell you about a school that's one of our innovators. Uh, B.B. Comer High School in Talladega County. They wanted to make sure that school didn't continue to look like that. They sold every desk in the building. There's not a desk in B.B. Comer High School. They have round tables where children are sitting in collaborative groups and they're working together to solve problems in math and science and English and social studies and career tech around real world problems that come from business and industry. And the most exciting part, I know this would never happen in Muscle Shoals, but in some school systems I've been in, teachers, I know it would never happen at Lawrence High School, teachers tend to build their little content kingdom back here in the corner of the classroom behind their computer and their desk and they disseminate information out to children and hope they get it. They ban that at B.B. Comer High School so that the teacher is having to walk around all day long interacting with students, asking probing questions, looking at student work. It is the most engaging thing you've ever, thing you've ever seen. 50% of the faculty left when they made the shift. And we've got great teachers in our state, but I tell our administrators every time I meet with them, leave these exit signs brightly lit so that the people who aren't willing to teach the children of today can find their way out. And what we find, <laughs> and what we tend to find is when you create these innovative sorts of opportunities for teaching and learning, those people get out real quick because they're not willing to do that hard work. They can't use their sheets they mimeographed 15 years ago, they're gone. They're gone. They're not willing to do work this hard. So we have a choice to either do this or we have a choice to do this. This picture is one that I took in May. And one of the things that I promised myself when I took this job that I would not lose sight of the real work, which happens in schools. So I visit a school once a week somewhere in the state of Alabama every single week that school's in session. Uh, I don't call and say that I'm coming. I don't let anybody know where I'm going because I know if I do, it'll turn into some event, which I am no event to be had, but they'll shut down the library and they'll invite the mayor and the board and we'll have orange juice and muffins and you know all that, <laughs> all that foolish stuff. So I don't tell anybody where I'm going. 
I'm not going as an I got you. I just want to see what's going on. My secretary is the only person who knows where I'm going. I get there at 6.30 in the morning so I can be part of the bus unloading and the whole start of school. I sign in and I say, take me to a classroom. I don't care where you take me, just take me to a classroom. And I stay in that classroom until lunch and then I go to lunch with the children and sit at the children's table, not the teacher's table, because that's when you really find out what's going on at school, <laughs> especially in high school and middle school. But uh, anyway, this is the last school I visited before school was out in May. It's Caslin Elementary School in rural Mobile County. 90% uh, free introduced lunch. Rural Mobile County, as close to Mississippi as you can get without going there. We've got some folks in the room that know exactly where Caslin is. Grand Bay, out near Grand Bay. Visited that school unannounced and I said, take me to a classroom. They took me to a fifth grade classroom and this is what I saw. I walked in and these kids were doing all this stuff and uh, could have cared less that I walked into that classroom because it was so engaging, which is exactly how every classroom needs to be. It shouldn't matter when the door opens. They're so engaged, they don't even want to look around. But I walked over, finally had to take, get this little boy in the orange shirt and I said, tell me what you're doing. He said, well, we're creating code. And I said, really? Uh, explain to me, I faked it real good, I said, explain to me what code is. He said, well, it's really computer science, but our teacher has told us not to use that term with adults because it's somewhat intimidating, but it's really, <laughs> you ask kids, they tell you. And uh, he said, but it's really just math that's fun. I said, okay, tell me more, I want to understand this. I said, well, you're going to create this code on your little device there, what are you going to do with it? He said, well, our teacher reached out to business and industry, reached out to our community college and brought in some engineers and we've built these robots that you can see over here to the right with a little boy's hand on it and we're going to program our robots and what you can't see is they had taken all the furniture out of their classroom Gary Daniel loved this they partnered with their career tech folks at the high school and came over and literally built a cityscape in their classroom of buildings and roads and detours and construction zones, what you'd see if you went to a city and had to travel through a city. Whole classroom was full of it. So their job was to create the computer code to program their robots to traverse a cityscape that they had created in their classroom. I sat there for three hours mesmerized. These kids had no earthly idea they shouldn't be able to do this. Nobody had told them differently. And at the end of those three hours, they took those eight robots and one by one they turned them loose and without exception, every one of those robots traversed that streetscape, came to one-way streets, detours, construction zones, went around this thing and came back to start. And I left last year's school year with this as my greatest burden as state superintendent because I thought if rural poor kids that have every demographic that says they shouldn't be able to do this can do this because nobody's told them differently, then why in the world are we not having this level of expectation for every child in the state of Alabama? That drives me every single day. That we should have fifth graders that can do computer science to program robots to traverse cityscapes. The sky's the limit. Sky's the limit for all kids because they have every reason not to do this. But the most important lesson I learned was from the teacher. The teacher in the classroom pulled me aside and this is for the teachers in the room and this is hard for us. It's hard for us teachers not to be the holder of all information. But she said, Dr. Bice, the only way we were able to do this was I had to admit to my children and be vulnerable that I didn't know how to do this either. But that I was not gonna let my inability and my lack of understanding hold them back from what I knew they could do, that I would get resources in to help us and we'd all sit down and learn together. What an empowering place to be as a teacher, to feel like you don't have to have every piece of the information when you start and are willing to say that out loud to your kids and that you're willing to learn together so that we're not holding any child back in this, folks, that is powerful. That is powerful and we're setting up policies now to create that environment, that safe place for teachers to be able to do that. Uh, the things I wanna share with you tonight, what does our redefined high school graduate look like? This is it possesses the knowledge and skills needed to enroll in and succeed in credit-bearing first-year courses at a two-year, four-year college, trade school, technical school, or workforce training program without the need for remediation. Not make AYP, which was the low-hanging fruit. This is a game-changer for us. But the biggest challenge, again, is on this side. And this is what business and industry and the folks who get our kids said they need them to do. Possess the ability to apply knowledge and skills to real world situations, to collaborate with peers in problem solving, critical thinking and defending their decisions verbally and in writing and a desire to continue to learn.
That's the game changer for the adults because a teacher can't teach children to do this if they continue to do to their students what I'm doing to you tonight, that you're to sit there and take in this information at some point regurgitated on some test. You go back to that experience that I described at Caslin. there's not a bubble-in test that will ever capture the learning that occurred there, but we're so test-driven that we tend not to do those sorts of things in public education. We're working to change that as quickly as we can. So that's our new graduate. Let me tell you what school systems can do when we turn them loose. One of the we want to make sure that every single thing that we're doing as part of Plan 2020 has a baseline, has an outcome that's projected, and we have measures all along the way to know how we're doing. In the past, we've just kind of hoped it would happen, and we would measure periodically to see. We're very strategic now with every single thing we're doing, and one of the primary ones is our graduation rate. We looked at our graduation rate in 2012 and it was 72% across the state. And that was unacceptable. And we said that out loud. But we looked at what would the graduation rate be in 2020 if we were aspirational. So we set a goal of 90% by the year 2020. And uh, I've been asked several times in these forums, what formula did you use? What did you use to come up with 90% by the year 2020? Nobody ever asked me that until about three weeks ago. So I'm I tend to be quite honest with my responses. I just woke up one day and made it up, <laughs> literally. Because the way we typically do things in education is when we have a problem, we set up a committee, and the committee will meet for three years <laughs> and debate and go back and forth, what do we need to do for these children? And then they'll pass it off to a task force, and then it finally has to go to the board, and by the time we finally make a decision, a whole 12 years of kids have left public education. So I decided we just weren't gonna do that, so I just made it up. And uh, the reason I made it up is because I believe in our kids after seeing that experience in Caslin, and I believe in our teachers. I believe our teachers have the ability to take our kids places we've never taken them before if we'll turn them loose, if we'll turn them loose. So that's what we decided to do. We also looked for the past 10 years what we've done to try to fix the dropout problem in the state of Alabama. We've spent right at a billion dollars over the last 10 years to fix the dropout problem in our state. And you know how much we've moved the needle over the last 10 years? Almost nowhere. Because the way we did it, Womack, this would drive you crazy, is we would come up with some program in Montgomery and decide it was the right answer for everybody and require 136 school systems to do this one program to fix the dropout issues in their community and have at least 5,000 pieces of paper you had to fill out to show that you did it, regardless of the outcome. So we said, that ain't working. So what could we do differently? So we said, Rather than telling 136 school systems what to do, here's your data. You go back and sit down with your parents, with your community, with your business and industry, with anybody you can gather together, and you come up with a plan on how you get kids from point A to point B. As long as we're shooting toward the same end goal, I don't care how you get there. And here are some resources and support to go do that. We turned them loose. And in one year, and let me go back and say, the arithmetic that was used to get us from 72 to 90 meant that we had to increase by 2% each year to get there. So we do still teach arithmetic in the state of Alabama, despite what you may hear or read on the internet. But we figured it out, so 2%. In one year, they increased by 3%. And that was a year when the superintendents in this room, including myself, still probably lived under the belief that if you do something innovative and not quite by the rules we've had before, the state's gonna come get you. The educators in the room, you can raise your hand if you want to, you don't have to. How many times have you heard in your career, the state's coming, <laughs> state's coming. You've heard it, state's coming. I'm gonna let you know a little secret that has been kept a deep, dark secret for a long time. I now have the keys to the whole place. Got them on January the 1st, 2012. I've been from the fifth floor to the basement and have discovered that we do not have this group sequestered down at the Gordon Persons building waiting to come get Janet Womack when she bends a rule or Lynn Heist to break a rule, not break a rule, bend a rule <laughs> to do what's right for children. We've shifted that too, and we do have a group that comes and gets the ones who aren't, and we take those school systems over. But the majority of school systems, we need to just need to turn them loose to do this innovative work. So the first year, 3%. The second year when they saw we really weren't gonna come get them, it increased by 5% in one year. One of the highest one-year gains in the nation. Did you ever see that as a headline in the public across the state of Alabama? Of course not, because it's good news about public education. In two years, 8% gain, and we're now at 80%. Halfway there in two years, rather than eight years. Folks, 
But the, the lesson learned there isn't what happened in Montgomery, it's what we allowed and finally gave local school systems and superintendents and principals and teachers and parents the ability to innovate and create different ways to get to the same end. You've got all sorts of innovation happening in this area of the state. You've got virtual schools, and I have to share this story about Sean. I share it every time I talk, is uh, you had a student, I probably should, he's the old enough that he didn't fall into FERPA anymore. Okay, I'm going to use his name anyway. Sean Forbes, my favorite kid from Florence High School. I don't get a lot of emails and phone calls from students, but I got a phone call and an email from Sean Forbes from Florence High School saying this, Dr. Bice, I'm a student at Florence High School in summer school, and I have not been a very good student all these years. And he started going through his list and be assured he had not. And uh, <laughs> he confirmed it on several levels. But uh, he said, I'm in summer school, and I really want to graduate, but summer school ends in three more days, and I need five more days, and I know that I can get all this math done. Can you call Florence High School and tell them to give me five more days <laughs> to summer school? Seriously, he did this. Love this kid. Well, needless to say, I did call Florence High School, but these folks, they'd already made plans for Sean. That was already a plan for him. And he called me back after that and said, Dr. Bice, I'm going to graduate. Would you come? I was so honored. Would not have missed it for anything. But the th reason I shared is I came to his graduation in, for summer school. It was just as important as, summer, as graduation was in May. They had caps and gowns. They had an orchestra. They had everything that everybody else could have. I was ashamed when I left that experience. I was a high school principal for years, and we had summer school for those kids who weren't successful, and we ran them through the ringer of summer school, and when it was over, they just went into the hinterlands, and we never knew where they ended up. When we start looking at kids and having grad, and that's the other thing, there's nothing that says we have to have one graduation a year. We have now school systems are having four a year. When kids get ready to graduate, graduate them, celebrate them, let them go, let them do what they need to do. Florence High School started that process. Now we have eight school systems that are doing that now because of what y'all do. I was in another school system recently in Walker County. And uh, they had for years tried to deal with their dropout rate by trying to fix it between eight and three and finally woke up and said, maybe if the grown folks change some of their actions, the kids might do differently. So now starting this year, they have twilight school where kids get to come to school from four to eight at night. They don't come during the day because the reality in poverty stricken Walker County is some kids have to work to support their families and their only option was to drop out of school to work. So finally, the adults realize if we change our behavior, then kids don't have to make that decision. Unbelievable numbers of kids that are now in high school from four to eight, all because the grown folks decided we're gonna serve children, not the system. We don't have anything that says we can't do that. Um, let me share another thing that gets asked a lot. What's gonna help us get there? What helps us get there are high standards. Standards that ask more of our children than we've asked of them before. In Alabama, we call them our college and career ready standards. Some people call them the common core, which to a lot of people is an evil word. But um, there's a lot of misinformation out about that. And I wanna just go ahead and lay this out there. I tend to be pretty blunt anyway. Uh, I'm the only living human being in the state of Alabama that was in the meeting in Chicago in 2008 when myself and 49 other people like me were sitting around in a meeting about education and a group of us were sitting around a table and we said, how do you develop standards for the things you teach in your state? How do you do it in Illinois? How do you do it in Massachusetts? How do you do it in Florida? How do you do it in California? How do you do it in Alabama? And we started sharing that and we realized we're all doing a lot of the same things, but some of us are getting different results than others. And we said, would it not be a good idea if we all got together and pulled the very best from all 50 states and looked at it and said, what if we put all that together and came up with a common set of standards that states could take back and take a look at and decide whether they want to use them or not? It's the best of all worlds. And internationally benchmarked them against countries like Finland and Singapore that are getting unbelievable results. So we did that work. Um, we brought them back to Alabama. We did the same thing we've done forever. We brought in a group of teachers and principals and administrators, college faculty, and said, look at these standards, decide what grade they need to be taught in, what subjects, what courses do they need to be divided into, decide if this is what we want or not. Folks in Alabama decided they wanted more, so they added standards to them that made it even more our own, and we rebranded it, Alabama's College of Career Standards. And I could go on and on about that process, but our board finally adopted them. Nobody made us, but the 
the moral to this story is I was in that meeting in 2008. Barack Obama was not in the room. Arne Duncan in the U.S. Department of Education was not guiding the process. None of the things that are said is true. It's just not. It's just not. I was there. But the main reason these standards are important is what they're requiring our adults to do. And in our old standards, probably not in the school systems that are represented here. I know not in Lauderdale County. Where are you? Where's that deer super? I know you're hidden in the back back there. I knew you were here somewhere. Uh, you'd never do this in Lauderdale County. But in Ellick City, where I was superintendent, we did this. In third and fourth grade, we'd give, teachers would give kids a bunch of math problems to work. Let's say three-digit addition. And we'd give them about 50 problems. They'd work them until they were sick of them. And this class would end. And we'd give them a take-home sheet with about 50 more problems on them for them to go work at home. And at some point, we just decide, okay, they've done enough and they know this. Uh, that's not, that doesn't mean they know it. In our house, with three teenage boys now, if you live with boys, you'll understand this totally. That meant mom and daddy knew how to do it because <laughs> boys aren't going to do this anyway, which started the divide between the haves and the have-nots because the vice boys are going to have their homework done, but the folks that didn't have parents at home didn't have theirs, so we started the divide by doing that. But anyway, homework is another issue for another day. But what we do now is we still teach arithmetic. We still teach the basic algorithms of addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. But once we've taught it, and let's say you're my class, and I've had you for four days, and we've been talking about X, and I say, based on the arithmetic that I've taught this week and that we've been talking about, take this real-world problem, the, seven, the eight of you around your round table, come up with as many potential, decide the mathematics that's required to solve it, Come up with as many potential solutions to it that you can. Choose the one that best answers the problem and explain to the rest of your class why you made that choice. That's the game changer. That's when you understand mathematics. That's when you have to apply what you've learned to a real world situation, which is exactly what people were asking our kids to be able to do. If I get one more phone call, I got one today and an email from a parent that was livid with me, livid that we're sending home work for our children to do that they can't, the parents don't understand and can't help them with. Thank goodness. I should surely hope that we're asking the children of today to be smarter than 50 years ago when their parents were in school. I will never apologize if the parents can't figure this out. They don't necessarily need to. But what it looks like in reality, this isn't their homework. What it looks like in reality, this is at Lincoln Elementary School. They had their math lesson for the week, and this is the way they assessed it. This is the way they assessed it, not with a bubble-in test, not with some multi-page of questions. They partnered with the McWayne Center and the If I Had a Hammer Foundation, and they built a house in one day from the foundation to the roof. Those children will never forget the mathematics that was involved in doing that because they took what they've learned and they did something with it. That's their test right there. When we begin to teach and learn that way, with hands-on opportunities for kids to do things. It's amazing what kids are able to do. Let me talk a little bit about assessment. As I've told you before, I'm not a big fan of assessment if we use it incorrectly and if it's not meaningful. And our assessments that we were giving previously were not meaningful. I showed you how far off the uh, Alabama high school graduation exam was. Uh, you may have seen recently some reports about how horrible we did on NAEP, which is the National Assessment of Educational Progress. This is not an excuse but it's another indication of how far off we were. For you elementary teachers in the room, our Alabama reading and math test, our ARNT test, our proficient level on the ARNT, which is what we were shooting for, if you compare it to NAEP, was below basic on NAEP. So no wonder our children don't score well on those national tests because our expectations are so far below what other people in the nation have tried to do because we wanted to make sure our test scores look good. We need to own where we are and push all our kids forward. So, we went back to two-year colleges, four-year colleges, business and industry, and said, what assessments do you use to allow kids to come into your institution, to grant scholarships, to do whatever? And we were lucky in the state of Alabama that we're a predominantly ACT state. So we said, why in the world do we reinvent the wheel? We've given the ACT since I was in school. It has 50 years of research behind it. Is it perfect? No. But is it a measure that's recognized and used across the state? Yes. So we said, don't reinvent the wheel. So we've adopted the ACT and work keys as our benchmark assessment for high school. We didn't set a cut score. 
That's what we did wrong on the graduation exam because when you set a cut score, everybody that, uh, that's under it works hard to get to it, and those that are above it just linger or actually digress. Now our goal is we keep the entire herd moving northeast regardless of where they start. <clears throat> so there's no cut score. The expectation is kids continue to improve until they can get to 36. <clears throat> the exciting part is we did away with our elementary test too and adopted a brand new test that's called ACT Aspire. And because of that, we now have a three through eight, through nine through 12, through two year college and four year college aligned assessment system. And we're the only state in the nation that has it and it's not federally funded and we're not part of the two common core federally funded assessment consortia by design. We wanted something different. But the main message is, and I know you would never do this in Colbert County, but in Ellick City, we used to do this thing after your assessments were given. We'd call the parents in, and you parents have probably experienced this, not in Colbert County, but uh, you'd come in after your child's test score comes in and the teacher sits down with you and we start going over the results and we'd say, Ed, uh, your child scored a scale score of 366 in math, which is a stay nine seven. And we'd all smile at each other like we knew what we were talking about and we'd sign the forms <laughs> and then we said we'd had the meeting, we'd put it in their file and we'd call it a day. We go home. Not a clue what we just talked about. Not a clue. But in our new assessments, y'all, this is going to be so powerful. I can go back to Ed and say, based on your child's score in math in fifth grade, if we do our job, if we do our job based on where your child is right now in math through 12th grade, we can predict a 34 in math on the ACT. That is a conversation that the child, the parent, the teacher, and all God's children can share and work together on because it's a common something that we all understand. That's exciting for me, that it can be informing. So uh, we're excited about what that might look like. Learning supports. We know that a lot of our kids come to school not ready to learn. Sean came to school with a lot of reasons not to learn. Um, if we know that, what are we going to do about it? We have a lot of people in the state that don't like us trying to fix things for poor kids. They feel like they, their parents need to suck it up a little bit and get to work and do those things to support their kids. Well, folks, we're dealing with children. We're not dealing with their parents. Last year in the state of Alabama, we served 95 million lunches. 64% of them were free. I want you to listen to that statistic one more time. 95 million lunches were served. 64% of them were free. So without a doubt, poverty is a huge issue. Children who come to school hungry and without the necessary things they have to wear and do school, they can't do school. You can't learn when you're hungry. So we've got breakfast programs now, we have lunch programs, we have all these things for kids, but we need greater services. <clears throat> Nothing drives me crazier than to look out my window in Montgomery and look at those other big white buildings down there that are filled with bureaucracy. And I think back to when I worked in Coosa County, which is one of the poorest counties in the state of Alabama. Nothing there but a bunch of pine trees and great people, $3 generals, period, and a flashing light. And I think about the parents in Coosa County and I think if my child needed services, how in the world would I make it through this bureaucracy to ever get to the services for my children? So I think it's our responsibility as adults to build these systems of support for these families and their children and just to show how impactful that can be when the grown folks are willing to give up their turf to do what's right for kids. These 10 school systems volunteered to work on this first. We now have 31 more that have joined it this year. We looked at all their systems and they chose one issue and they chose attendance. They said, we're gonna work on attendance. And we're gonna connect with churches and community organizations and parents and anybody that would come to work with us and develop these networks to get kids to school. Because they focused on it and got the community involved in one year they reduced their unexcused absences in these 10 school systems by 30% and recouped 110,000 days of instruction in one year. That shows what can happen when grown folks are willing to do what's right for children. That's just the tip of the iceberg of what we can do when we could continue to develop these wraparound services. Uh, gonna jump to some things I need you to do. I need you to imagine. Imagine is my favorite word in the English language. I just love it because it's so wide open. Imagine, and we've held our teachers and folks captive for over a decade from imagining what they might do. I wanna ask you this, imagine school, the top one, as an experience not restricted by place and time. Why does all the learning have to occur in this building? It doesn't have to. 
That's crazy. That's the way we've always done it. We continue to build these big old mega schools that look just like those factories we built for the last 50 years where we put kids through in batches based on their birthdays and we spit them out four years later. What if we took that same money and created learning environments that can happen anywhere, anytime, 24-7, based on the interest and aptitudes of our kids? What might that look like? You've got glimmers of that happening all over the place right here at Florence. You've got a virtual high school now where kids aren't coming every day to do this. And there's people go crazy when you start doing that. What are those teachers doing if the kids aren't coming every day? Well, you're doing this based on what they're working awfully hard. But uh, why don't we do that sort of thing? If you've had a child that went to college, when they go to college two months after they left high school, do they go to school every day? Do they have everybody handing them everything? Do they use technology to interact with their teachers and tur turn, in, turn in assignments and find out what's next? Yes, they do. Why shouldn't we be creating a senior environment that gets them ready for what comes next? Absolutely, we need to. Doesn't have to happen at a certain time or place. A policy environment, let me ask you another one. Why does learning have to occur only by books rather than through content? Why in the world, I'm about to step all in somebody's business this time probably, why in the world do we keep buying books? Content is available everywhere. Why in the world, as soon as we buy a book, it's old, it's archaic. We begin to do these sorts of things, we're going to have lots more money than we thought we had. A policy environment that encourages innovation and creativity and allows safe space for risk and failure. Think back to that experience at Caslin Elementary School. That would have never happened if that teacher didn't feel like that she could make mistakes and take risk. And that's why we're re-looking at how we use our assessments. We'll always have to give some assessment, but it's how we use it that's important. Gay Barnes is sitting in this room, Alabama's Teacher of the Year, several years ago. But uh, you get her started about the misuse of assessment, you will get your ear burnt by that woman. She knows what I'm talking about. Assessment can be valuable, but we've got to be awfully careful how we use it or we'll misuse it. We use it to inform instruction. We're doing great things, and that's what we want to give teachers the ability to do. Let me go to the last one. This is the one that causes lots of disruption. I love it. A learning environment where learning is the constant and time is the variable, knowing the disruption it will create in the system. Some of you may not realize this, but until two years ago, to earn a credit in a high school in the state of Alabama, regardless of what the subject was, you had to have 140 hours of instruction to get a credit. It's called a Carnegie unit. The Carnegie unit was put into practice in education in 1922. And there have been a few changes in the world since 1922, but not in public education. 140 hours to get a credit. That again assumes that 745,000 children that are walking into school are all the same and they need the same thing and we're gonna spit them out at some time later. So we went to our state board and real quickly got them to pass a resolution that says we're doing away with the Carnegie unit. And we didn't do away with it totally because that would cause too much disruption. But if a school wants to base it on proficiency and aptitude, which is exactly what Humphrey was talking about, they can now do that. And what that means is, let's say you're my incoming Algebra I class. And I don't know anything about you. You're coming from the middle school. And we know about the middle school. We know about those children. But let's say you're in my incoming Algebra I class. And on day one, I give you my comprehensive final that I was going to give you 36 weeks later. And the four of you ace it. Why in the world should you have to sit there for 36 weeks to get a credit in Algebra 1 when you just showed me you have the proficiency that I was going to measure 36 weeks later? You now have permission to do that. They did it in Oxford City Schools when school started this year. They gave their finals on the first day. Anybody who aced that final got the credit that day, which meant for the next three days or week, Total disruption to the high school master schedule. <laughs> Total disruption. And, the, and you laugh, but the high school folks in the room know how this works. When that master schedule gets done about mid-June, you don't mess with that master schedule, regardless of the needs of the children. Because we all know that Janet has had fourth block planning for the last 25 years. We're not real sure why, but she has. And we may do that first assessment and realize we need Janet to teach something during fourth block, but rather than listen to Janet whine and complain for 36 weeks, we don't do that. The day we start moving the adults around to meet the needs of our children in this disruptive environment, you will be amazed at what our kids can do. We can now go back to our colleges of engineering, 
to our folks that are asking where our STEM kids are and can answer the question, we know where they've been. We've been holding them captive in Algebra 1 for 36 weeks rather than turning them loose. But you know what our biggest obstacle is? Us. When I shared this with teachers for the first time, the one question that was posed to me was, oh my goodness, we may run out of things we currently have to teach. What a wonderful opportunity to have. Why in the world are we restricted because AP Calculus appears to be the last thing we can offer? Dream up another one. Connect with our community colleges and get them into college early. Connect with UNA, get them into college early. There's nothing that says you have to have four years of high school. It just says you have to have 24 units of credit to graduate. Get them when you want to, leave when you want to, go where you want to next as long as you're prepared. If we're willing to serve children and not the system. So why do we need to do all this? because of Sam. I met Sam on one of my visits. He was at an elementary school in Huntsville, and he's in pre-K, not kindergarten, pre-K. And I go over to Sam, and I start asking Sam what he's doing, and he was real proud that he was working on the letter V on his tablet. And uh, I said, well, tell me about this. He told me about doing the letter V. And I said, well, if you're on letter V, you've obviously done your other letters too. He went, oh, yes, sir, I have them archived. Would you like me to pull them up? Oh, yes, he did. Oh, yes, he did. Pre-K. And the reason I share that is when Sam leaves pre-K to go to kindergarten or first grade or second grade, he's not expecting to be sitting there coloring in a map of the globe. He's not expecting to sit in a row of chairs and work insane problems with no explanation off a worksheet that was developed 15 years ago. He's not expecting the same thing that we've been delivering for a long time. We have an opportunity now because we've created this new policy environment with a newly defined high school graduate with a, a set of standards that take kids to higher thinking, with an assessment system that actually has meaning that leads to college and career readiness, with wraparound services to help the kids that aren't ready. I didn't have time to go through. We're working with all of our teacher preparation programs to redesign them so they become more engaged in a medical model, a clinical model, so these to be teachers have time out in real schools, seeing what it really looks like, and then a policy environment to create school anywhere, anytime, 24 seven. Folks, it's an opportunity we've never had before, but if we don't seize it, those folks that fund us in Montgomery are gonna look to us and say, they're not gonna take this opportunity, so let's find a new way and take this money and put it somewhere else. We have to, as local communities, leap outside our comfort zone and do what's right for kids, the one voice that is missing the most in this whole conversation are our children. If we really want to know what we need to be doing, if we sit down with kids and engage them in what is it that you would want school to look like if you could create it, that's where the answer is. I'm so excited we've got kids in this audience tonight. The first time in any of these we've had kids. Guys, you're the answer to this. Your job tomorrow is to sit down with your teacher based on what you've heard tonight and create a school that you'd like to go to. And then go to your superintendent, whatever school system you go to, and your school board, and say, folks, this is what we want. This is what we want, and this is what we demand. Because we want to learn and be as smart as we can possibly be. That's your homework, guys, regardless of what your teachers that are with you told you to do. you got to pass on that homework. you got to pass on that homework. you got new homework. Create the school you want to go to. And work with these grown folks in this room and see what that can look like. They'll listen to you. I promise you they'll listen to you. And it will be amazing, along with your teachers and your parents, what you can create. We have a place now to do that. So uh, my message tonight is we engage you. We want you to be part of this. We want you to carry the message forward. We want you to hold us accountable. If you're a parent or a community member, you've heard this. Don't let us slip back into our old ways. Don't let Janet... Don't let this board, don't let the rest of the superintendents that are re represented in this room, Tim and everybody else I know that's here, don't let them slip back into that. Demand it, because it's easy for us to do that. It's easy to slip back. But together, if we do it collaboratively, we can create unbelievable opportunities for our kids. So I just thank you. I thank you for the opportunity to be able to share this with you tonight. I hope it's given you some opportunity to understand what we're trying to do in public education, which is quite different, um, and uh, need you. We need you. We need you to be the voice for our kids, the voice for our school systems. Push us to do great and wonderful things. So thank you so much for your attention. Thank you.
All right, sit down, sit down. Sit down, you're not supposed to, sit down, you're not supposed to have fun in school. Sit down. But I do need you to stand up one more time because I need to tweet that. Stand up real quick. I'm a big Twitter. Let's, you know, give Florence a shout out here. Here we go, guys. Come on. Two. Okay. Not for me, for you. Okay, here we go. Okay, we've got a few questions I think Melissa's going to ask, and I'll do my best to answer them. This is, uh, oh, can we turn this mic on, guys? Testing. If it doesn't work, I'll read them. Testing. There okay, there we go. This is the last call for the comment question cards. Please give them to Darren or Ed. They'll take those up and bring them down here, and we'll go through the, the cards. The first one that we have is, is, a, is a good one. It's one that we haven't had in any other cities. My son is a 2011 high school graduate. He passed his grad, grad exam and graduated with a B average. He's having trouble now pinpointing exactly what he would be good at and what to pursue as a career. Are there programs out there to help him now that he's a, a graduate to be successful in a career? What would be a good way, you know, a good program for him to Absolutely. Look into. I'm going to speak on behalf of UNA and the local community college. I know for a fact that they have a career center at each of those schools, wherever this child may be. If you'll go to that career center, they will help you. They can even assess what your interests are and what your aptitude is to help you get into the right place. If you can't do that, if you went to Florence High School, come back and see Lynn and she'll do it for you. <laughs> Won't you? I know you would. We have a couple questions in the audience tonight specifically about dyslexia. So I'm going to start with a general one and then I've perused through them and we'll sure. pick out some specific um, aspects of them. One in five students struggle with dyslexia. What can we do to ensure that Alabama teachers and administrators are deep, deeply trained in the structure of language as Orton Gillingham approach to reading, using the Orton Gillingham right. approach to reading? We, we provide every summer and we try to include as many teachers as we can that we know are currently teaching dyslexic children to come to our mega conference in Mobile and we take them through a week-long training that we work along with the Scottish Rite organization to ensure that the training is of quality, uh, to, in, to begin to have as many teachers as possible trained. Are we hitting every teacher that has a dyslexic child? I'm sure we're not, because we don't have a way right now to identify where they are, but when we know, we're, we're providing that training every single summer for as many teachers as we can get in there. I would say to the identification aspect of what you just said, they, one of the questions was, currently kids with dyslexia are not able to obtain a 504 or IEP. They're lost in the classroom and there's no help for them. How can we better identify them or what is the aspect, what is the problem regarding the IEP 504? You know, I'm not sure that they're excluded from having a 504 plan if it's, as in, if it's in affecting and impacting their uh, education negatively. Let me look back at that and see, but I don't think there's anything that precludes that. Yeah, well, she says not able plan. to obtain, so. Sure, similar. I would, again, it's easy for me to give a broad answer, but those answers are best answered mm -hmm. at the local level. I hate to throw that back on the local folks, but it really is a local function. And we do have your emails on these cards, so if there's yeah. a more specific answer that needs to be given, Dr. Bice will. Yeah, we go back and we record all these responses and who ask, and if we have that information, we follow up with the question. Okay. And oh, we did have um, one specific question about Dr. Mabry's um, style of, let me find that card, I apologize. There we go. It's called the Multisensory Language Education Program that Dr. Mabry, I mean, I'm sorry, Dr. Whetstone, not Dr. Mabry, Dr. Whetstone helped to create. So I'll give that card to you as well so that yeah. you can email her back specifically about that, that style of training. How many parents and teachers were on the committee that decided on Common Core? Uh, the entire committee was teachers. I don't, know, I don't know the exact numbers. They were all teachers, administrators, and professors, and parents from the state of Alabama. So uh, it was no outside entities involved in that at all. I don't know the exact numbers. Mm -hmm. What is your position on the Accountability Act? This law by Republican Del Marsh caught lot, cost Lauderdale County, Limestone Morgan County, various amounts. What is your opinion on it now? Uh, wouldn't touch it. Um, Politically, I, I try not to get into that. Uh, I'm not afraid of choice. Uh, one of the issues with the law is that the definition of failing schools was somewhat skewed, and we end up with some schools on there that really aren't failing schools, they're actually high performing schools. Uh, we need to own the fact that we have some schools that are underperforming, and we have, and we've actually taken over five school systems and gone in and done what was right. I'll give you an example of what that might look like. It's not gonna happen here, obviously. But uh, 
Midfield City Schools, two months into the job, had a 46% graduation rate. Dismal. Wouldn't ask anybody in this room to set foot in Midfield High School when we walked in that school. They had guards on every hallway. Half the teachers never came to school because they were afraid of the kids. It was total bedlam. Uh, we went in the first day, we fired the superintendent, the CFO, the high school principal, the middle school principal, and about half the faculty at the schools, won all the lawsuits, so it can be done. Uh, two years later, they have an 80% graduation rate, whole new adult set at their school. Same kids would welcome you to come to that school anytime and see some of the most engaging instruction you could ever imagine. The kids have not changed, the grown folks did. So uh, that's the sort of things we have to do to make it happen. You sent out a 2013 memo about students staying seven hours a day at some high schools. Seniors who have reached 24 credits and, for example, only need four during their senior year, are they, should they be scheduled all day? I, I think that's the gist of his question. No. It makes no sense for them to be scheduled all day. Now, you can't just turn them loose, but you can sure as heck graduate them. If you turn them loose, you may have some, some issues. But if you've got your 24 hours, of, if you've got your 24 credits, why should you stay? The high school folks in the room will know this all too well. We spend a lot of time creating electives to fill up kids' schedules that only drives us to discipline problems because they didn't choose to be in it anyway. We're just filling up their schedule. There's nothing that prevents us under this new Flexibility Act to do what's right for kids. That's, that's if you're going to keep them all day, they need to be enrolled with something. Graduate them. Get them enrolled in job shadowing. Get them enrolled in something. Get them enrolled in an internship, in an apprenticeship. There's a million things through career and technical education that could be involved in that doesn't require them to be there. And if you'd like to learn more about the flexibility that's allowed with the innovation uh, proposals, that it's on our website under innovation proposals if you search for that. And you can see other school districts that have innovative procedures Florence for their school day. One. I love your plan, but what are you going to do for parents that are not necessarily equipped and, and I think essentially she's saying ready for the change, ready for this plan? for parents? Uh, continue to engage parents. There, there's nothing magical about this. There's nothing overwhelming about this when you really sit down and look at it. All we've done is define a high school graduate based on where they go next and put in place those things that will help take them there. It's not a one size fits all. I didn't have time to even go into this piece, but we've also done away with all of our diplomas that kids used to have to choose, and we now only have one diploma in the state of Alabama, but with multiple pathways to get there. Uh, which was real disruptive to our counselors at the high school and middle school for sure because now you have to talk to every single child and find out what they're interested in and actually build their schedule based on a conversation with them, which is kind of what we're supposed to do. But uh, <clears throat> we don't apologize for that because all kids are made differently. Uh, that gives us lots of opportunities to get there. So it's not really as restrictive as it used to be. So it's, a, it's not a one-size-fits-all. It's actually much broader than it's ever been. How will you work on the use of drugs and the inability for a student to pass a drug test? How will we support those students so that they don't fall to drugs? How can we help students at a social level? Uh, again, I'm real careful not to try to come up with a solution in Montgomery and tell the eight school systems that are represented here how to do that. Uh, that's a local decision. What we can do in Montgomery is set aside some resources and things for them to choose from, but those decisions are best made at the local level. What may work in Florence may be totally different in Muscle Shoals, may be totally different out in the county. So uh, there's not a one size fits all to that. If we implement your plans, when will Alabama move from the bottom percentile to the top 10%? How long will it take? What are some of the mile markers that we may have to overcome to get there? Uh, I think we, you will see this move very quickly, and I didn't share this. We've actually had an a third party do an analysis of Plan 2020 on what it will mean to our state when we meet some of our benchmarks. And if you just take graduation rate, when we get to 90% graduation rate, which I feel certain we will far before the year 2020, this study shows that it will have a $430 million impact on our state every year we maintain a 90% graduation rate, which is the same thing as opening a Mercedes or an Airbus in the state every single one of those years. So our message to our legislators, and I know they had to leave, is if you'll fund the work that we're trying to do, we can be our own solution to the Education Trust Fund budget by creating income and sales tax to go back into it. What's the biggest obstacle to your plan? Uh, status quo. People being very comfortable of where they are, uh, even myself. There's still a part of me and my children go to public school. I have two sons that go to Benjamin Russell High School, a senior and a sophomore. 
I went to that high school. I came back years later as the principal of that high school. A lot of history and tradition there. Part of me wants them to have that experience that I had, but I know that that's not right, and I have to catch myself not falling back into holding them back from something that's very different. My oldest son, who's not there now, he's in one of our community colleges, getting a, deg a two-year degree in industrial electronics after a trial run at several other places. But anyway, um, <laughs> he'll die if he sees this somewhere. But anyway, I didn't, I didn't call his name, though, so that's a good thing. Um, what, what we've learned is we can't let our experience hold him back. Uh, my middle child is doing dual enrollment. My other child is going to do fine arts. We just have to open it up and be willing to change with our kids. And be we can hold on to tradition, but uh, we can't let it hold our kids back. The Times Daily indicated just this week that our state is spending $895,000 in legal and administrative fees to end electronic bingo. What's the likelihood that the powers that be will allow any fraction of that revenue to be spent on the innovative standard of education that you're suggesting? The way budgets work in the state of Alabama, everything is, and this is something we would love to see changed. So if you want your voice to be heard in Montgomery, almost every cent that comes out of Montgomery is earmarked for something specific. So I feel certain that the money that's being spent legally to defend whatever that was, bingo, mm -hmm. wouldn't touch that with a 10-foot pole, uh, to defend <laughs> bingo can't be used for education. Is that the way it has to be? Probably not. But that's the way we typically, the legislature typically funds things. Everything's earmarked. So the answer to your question is right now, no. If you get active and talk to the people that were here earlier about what they do in Montgomery and urge them to do something differently, possibly so. I graduated from Hatton High School in 2006. Over the past decade, I have seen the effects of shrinking jobs in Lawrence County culminating with the close of international paper in Cortland. How will Plan 2020 utilize student programs, progress, I'm sorry, to attract new business to North Alabama. I uh, had this conversation right before this meeting tonight. We have 10 workforce development councils across the state of Alabama, and this is something that K-12 education has typically not done, is we meet now regularly with workforce development councils so that we can look in this area of the state of Alabama, what's the five-year, 10-year, 20-year projected workforce needed in this area so we can backload down into K-12 what that looks like and we can take our career and technical education programs, and I know that Gary Dan's just increased from three to 11 programs over in Muscle Shoals, making sure that those programs are aligned with what business and industry is projecting the needs are for the next several years and aligning that with our community colleges so we're not duplicating services. For the first time, we have that agreement in place so we can inform those decisions. So we're not over here having 10 programs of cosmetology when we know that the job market is asking for more industrial engineers. We now have a way to inform that. And here's another partnership question. What are we doing or what more can we do to carry the, uh, these ideas into the two-year and four-year college classroom? Two-year colleges is right there with us. One of the things that we've agreed to do, and I had this scenario in Ellick City where I was superintendent, Benjamin Russell High School was right here and we had a welding program. Central Alabama Community College was less than an, one mile away over here and they had a welding program. Well, Mark Heinrich and I were both new to our jobs. We didn't know any better. So we said, does it make it, why didn't we have one place where high school kids and college kids come together to use the same space, the same people, which cuts the money and need in half. So we're using space and people collaboratively. That is in place now. Mm -hmm. So we feel very comfortable that you'll see a big change. And uh, I know in Decatur, not far from here, uh, they actually, rather than opening programs in their high school, contracted with the community college to provide those courses that were already being offered at Calhoun and paid the tuition of their kids to go there because it was cheaper to pay their tuition to go than to hire a teacher and set up a program over here at their high school. There's nothing that says we can't do that. We've just never thought we could. I feel arts integration is a useful tool to positively affect the graduation rate. It is crucial, and that's why of the state board's four priorities, funding priorities that went across to the governor last year, integration of the arts and arts programs was one of the four. And uh, regretfully, <laughs> don't clap, don't, don't get excited. Uh, regretfully, a lot of people aren't convinced that the arts leads to anything other than enjoyment. Uh, knowing that the arts has such critical thinking and problem solving and creativity and innovation, all that's built into it. Um, 
Regretfully, most of our teacher preparation programs no longer even offer arts integration as part of their undergraduate preparation program. It's gone away. When I first went to the State Department five years ago in another position, I had the job of visiting our schools that had gone into school improvement, our most underperforming schools. I quickly noticed one thing that they all had in common. Not one of them had a viable arts program. Not one of them. It was a one common factor that they all had. So we know it's a factor. We have it as a priority. Uh, we hope we'll get funding for it this year. Can you address the difference between the ACT benchmark scores and those the two-year and four-year colleges accept to avoid remedial classes? Example, ACT benchmark score for English is 18. A community college is uh, 20. Right. Uh, we're working on that right now. That was one of those disconnects that we knew was there. We have 26 community colleges. We have 26 different cut scores on what remediation means. So they're working with us now to come up with a common definition of remediation because like I told them, we can get this remediation thing taken care of, but I can't hit 50 targets. Y'all got to get together and come together on what this looks like. Same thing with our four-year colleges. They're working on the same thing. So we're working to get that aligned. We're on our last question. Okay. Just a reminder that all the questions will be posted categorically or specifically on our website at the conclusion of the tour stops in mid-October. This says it's from Dr. Womack, but I didn't see her turn in one, so I'm not sure. It says, what are Auburn's chances on Thursday night against K-State? <laughs> War Eagles, all I gotta say. Darn Eagle. good, darn good. Uh, let me again. Uh, the questions were great, and the ones that I might not have gotten down into the weeds on, we'll get them to you, especially the dyslexia questions, because I feel certain that came from parents, and we want to make sure that you're equipped with what you need to make sure your kids get what, you, what they need. Uh, but again, I want to thank you. Uh, if I can ask you to just do one thing, imagine. Imagine what public education would look like if we take advantage of this flexibility and this opportunity to move in a new direction. And the little guys in the room, you got homework. And I'm going to be looking for a report. Where do you all go to school? Muscle Shoals, where do y'all go to school? Where? Okay. Muscle Shoals, so Muscle Shoals, I need a report. Uh, I need to hear what y'all create over the next several days of what public education would look like if you were turned loose to create it. I look forward to it, I promise you, I'll post it across the state because it's the first time we've had kids present to do this. I look forward to what you're gonna create, guys. Y'all do good stuff, thank you.